Hello everyone, I'm Greg Weaver. Welcome to The Audio Analyst. With episode 148, I shared my remarkable recent experiences with the simply splendid stylus and record care products from the Last Factory in Livermore, California. The name LAST is an acronym for Liquid Archival Sound Treatment. I first came upon and used the LAST products back in the 1980s. There were two stylus formulations, one to clean and a second for preservation, two different LP cleaners, one all-purpose and one for power cleaning, and finally, to my mind, their pièce de résistance, their utterly remarkable record preservative. It should be noted that they also make a host of optical disc and magnetic tape care products as well. While I do not pursue optical or magnetic media use to any length these days, I must assume, based on the efficacy of their LP and stylus products, that these products are deserving of your attention if you do. Today, I want to highlight on the efficacy and incomparable value of using the last record preservative, a product I see as indispensable to anyone serious about vinyl playback. There are other products out there that claim to improve sound and to help to preserve your LPs, none of which enjoy the notoriety or reputation of the last factory's formulation, originally developed in 1979 by Lawrence Livermore Laboratory scientists Ed Catalano and Emmett Wren, along with audio expert Walter Davies. And guess what? These cats weren't out to start a business, or even to create a product. Their motivation was the purest of all. They just wanted to find a way to preserve their own record collections. In my discussions in episode 148, I pointed out that it was my own idiocy that led to my abandoning the use of these extremely effective products in the late 1990s, as given their dearth of both advertising materials and coverage by the audio press, I had mistakenly assumed that the rise of the CD had spelled their demise. I was adult and was clearly just not paying attention. But the practical resurrection of this unique brand must be credited to the foresight and efforts of audio enthusiast Jeff Kasky, a longtime friend of The Last Factory's co-founder, Walter Davies. Recognizing that the strong resurgence and reinvigorated interest in the LP presented an excellent opportunity to grow The Last Factory's exceptional line of products, after devising a plan that would create a partnership with Walter, structured so that Walter would remain with the company as an advisor, Jeff agreed to purchase last. The two worked together in that capacity until Walter passed away in 2020 at the age of 83. When I recently reached out to Jeff asking him some questions, including as much detail as he could comfortably provide on how the formulation works, he responded by explaining that even at the factory, they don't like saying the name of the secret ingredient, not even in their accounting or other in-house documentation. He explained that as such, Walter had begun the practice of just referring to that ingredient as magic. Jeff's next point was a clarification about chemical terminology, explaining that when you see a bead of water form on a surface like glass, the bead of water you see is the result of the strength of the molecular bonds which prevent that bead from just spreading out evenly across the surface. This is a manifestation of the bond strength known as surface tension. Different liquids will have different amounts of surface tension, and by extension, that same concept, when applied to solids, is called surface energy. Again, different solids exhibit different surface energy. If you want to exert less drag as one surface, 
say a diamond stylus, is dragged across another surface, say our vinyl LP. An excellent way to do so is to reduce the surface energy of one or both materials. Jeff stressed that this is fundamentally different from just introducing a lubricant between the two surfaces, though it should be obvious that the result would be similar. Noting that changing the surface energy characteristics of a diamond would be difficult, but that vinyl, being a polymer with plasticizers, a semi-permeable material, opens the door to introduce compatible chemicals that diffuse into the polymer and will reduce its native surface energy. By reducing that surface energy, and thus decreasing drag, you may successfully reduce the ability to put dynamic force into the vinyl surface, which he says also dramatically reduces the intensity of the resultant shock wave created by the stylus transcribing the groove. As I mentioned in episode 148, a phono stylus set to track in the vicinity of 2 grams translates to the equivalent of over 2 tons of pressure at and on the LP's groove walls. The result of the friction generated by the stylus at these pressures creates immense heat, which is very destructive to the record's life. Measurements published by Vandenhall show that those temperatures reach 320 degrees Fahrenheit or 160 degrees Celsius. The original literature last presented in the 1990s suggested that the record preservative's ability to diminish the vinyl's native surface energy and its resultant relaxed drag and shockwave generation was able to reduce the generation of heat by almost 100 degrees. This drastically diminished destructive energy produced by the extreme pressure and friction of the surface-to-groove interaction not only all but halts the physical deterioration of the vinyl's surface for something on the order of 200 plays, but it improves its perceptible sonic performance as well. Now at this point, he had addressed another of my questions, which was to understand why any LP immediately post-treatment with the preservative sounded significantly improved. My listening experience is comparing the sonics of a newly treated record to that same record before its treatment with the last preservative revealed consistent enhancements, though to occasionally varying degrees. Among those enhancements were notably reduced surface noise, resulting in a quieter presentation overall, refining microdynamic clarity and expressiveness. Tone and timbre were presented more vividly, Image focus and specificity were enhanced, as were resolution and its resultant transparency, and the record would often seem slightly louder. He explained that by chemically reducing the vinyl surface energy and its interrelated drag reduction, the stylus is freer to follow the groove more accurately, and that the amount of improvement will be dependent on an assortment of variables, such as the compliance of the cantilever, the diamond profile and polish, the formulation of the vinyl used, even, believe it or not, the kinds of tracks you are listening to. The result is a secondary, synergistically beneficial byproduct of the chemical changes the preservative makes necessary to extend the playback life of your records. He explained that while magic has not changed since day one of the last factory, the key to its successful application is the use of an effective delivery carrier. That carrier is a fluid that has to be totally miscible with magic, meaning that it must form a homogeneous mixture with magic. It has to be completely harmless to the vinyl formulations used for records, and it must cleanly dissipate, leaving no trace of itself once its task is done. It turns out that certain chlorofluorocarbons, specifically freons, were capable of doing just that. So freon was the obvious choice for their first carrier fluid when the product was introduced in 1979. 
But as the EPA began phasing out Freon in 1992, heralding its eventual ban, big chemical companies like 3M and DuPont went to work developing substitutes with comparable properties, but without the negative environmental impact concerns. Last settled on one of the more recent carrier fluids from 3M's family of such products. Among its other desirable attributes, it still exhibits the property of very rapid evaporation, leaving nothing of itself behind. The only thing left behind on the vinyl is magic. The fluid is available in two, eight, or 16 fluid ounce bottles at roughly 65, 229, or $433 respectively. And each bottle includes the required plastic pipettes and microfiber application brushes, and the last dot stickers used to indicate which LPs have already been treated. The two ounce bottle is estimated to treat about 180 sides, or roughly 90 LPs. So one may extrapolate about 360 or 720 LPs for the larger bottles, which would break down to about 72, 64, or 61 cents per record treated with each larger sized bottle. Application is a snap. Last suggests placing a clean record on your turntable or a clean firm surface. I use a freshly cleaned glass tabletop just outside one of the doors of my music room. Once you have the record prepared, you open the bottle of fluid and fill the pipette to its guide mark, which is roughly about one squeeze of the ball. The current instructions say to gently squeeze the dropper along the length of the microfiber applicator brush to evenly distribute the fluid. I still use the older instructions, which suggested holding the applicator brush almost perpendicular to the bottle, with the bottom end over the open bottle's mouth and dispensing the fluid from the pipette starting at the top of the brush and letting it flow down the applicator, allowing excess to flow back into the bottle. While this violates the age-old chemistry lab rule never to return excess chemicals to the master bottle, it does prevent excess waste of fluid. Next, you place the applicator on the record surface, rolled to one side. Then, with a continuous, gentle sweeping motion, you follow the record grooves around the record twice while rolling the applicator to help distribute the preservative more evenly. Once the first side is done, just flip the LP, re-wet the applicator, and repeat. All that is left to do is to place one of the last dots on the record jacket to indicate that your record has been treated and you are done. No meaningful waiting time is needed once you see that the carrier fluid has evaporated. And though there is a diffusion process that occurs over a relatively brief period, as the preservative treatment is absorbed into the outermost 10 or so molecular layers of the record surface, you may play or return the treated LP to its sleeve by the time you've put the cap back on the bottle. And do that quickly. Recall that one of the properties of this fluid is its rapid evaporation. But according to Jeff, chemically speaking, the sonic benefits will improve slightly over a day or two. One further point on its application here. The electrical engineering persona in Jeff felt that rather than place the record on any surface, perhaps a better idea would be to use a simple platform that would support a record only by its central label, so that the bottom side would never touch anything. This would allow the record to be cleaned without finding a clean surface to work on and make it easier to do the cleaning on a crowded surface. He was driven to create The Last Stand. Sorry, I think it's a clever title, don't you? And it turns out that it has become a popular device with users. You may buy one of these stands from Last for about $60, or you may make one with parts readily available at a hardware store by watching the tutorial video at their site. I have provided links for both. Finally, my, my last question to Jeff had to do with what impact 
cleaning an already treated LP would have, especially cleanings with an ultrasonic cleaner like my Audiodesk Vinyl Pro X. Would it diminish its effectiveness? Given ultrasonic cleaning works by using cavitation bubbles induced by high-frequency sound pressure waves to mechanically beat on the vinyl surface, he responded that it is certainly possible that some magic is physically removed from the polymer matrix. But noting that ultrasonic cleaners use different frequencies and approaches, and that their testing has shown that higher frequencies do less damage to plastics, he added that ultrasonic cleaners like the audio desk are likely safer for multiple and extended use than some others. Overall, he still feels that cleaning treated LPs manually or with vacuum-powered machines will have the least impact on the preservative's durability. I hope you now have both a better understanding of how this remarkable last record preservative works and why I find it to be an indispensable addition to my vinyl playback ritual. This product should be seen as a necessary. I simply cannot imagine LP playback without its implementation, driving both the short and long-term benefits it affords. I would wager that once you try it, you will be as impressed with its contributions as I have been. In closing, I want to thank Jeff for his generosity in offering his detailed responses to my questions, many of which are answered on the last factory website, and for manufacturing and distributing such exceptional products to significantly enhance the LP playback experience for music lovers. If you aren't using the last record preservative, you have yet to release and experience all the potential detail, nuance, and magic captured in your record's grooves. As always, thank you for taking the time to drop by today. Further information on supporting the channel may be found in today's description section or at my website, theaudioanalyst.com. Please stay safe and keep the music playing. Till next time, cheers.